Ah, Capcom. Back in the day, Capcom and Konami were as beloved as Coke and Pepsi. Then like most modern companies, Capcom's had a bit of a dark period which descended into them being almost as hated as Konami. But unlike Konami, they've managed to skate by most of the controversy and in recent days, they've entered something of a renaissance, churning out hit after hit after hit after hit. That being said, it's important not to forget their more dubious actions, as those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And from one gamer to another, there are many things that Capcom has done that we don't want to see repeated. What are you doing here? I let myself in. Okay. So today, I and my guest and resident Capcom fanboy, The Quarter Guy, will be counting the top 10 Capcom fails for your viewing pleasure. Both Josh and I have quite a bit of experience with various Capcom franchises, some of which are different between us. So when a company that puts out games that we both love screws up the way Capcom has, we sure as heck take notice. Get your weapons ready. DLC has been both a blessing and a curse. The curse being that it's regularly exploited by companies to sell people parts of a completed game at ludicrous prices. But at the same time, it's allowed games to quickly deliver patches or balancing, the service is convenient, and you don't have to release 10 billion versions of the same game because someone thinks Meta Knight is too OP. Probably the most infamous case of that last instance is the myriad versions of Street Fighter 2. Now, don't get us wrong, Street Fighter 2 is not only an astronomical improvement over the archaic and forgotten original, but it practically put traditional fighting games on the map and codified some of the traditions of the genre. Some of them by accident. And then they made Champion Edition, which made the bosses playable and gave us mirror matches. Then in the same year, we had Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting, which featured faster playing speed, a few new moves, and some palette swaps. Then a year later, there was Super Street Fighter 2, which added four new characters and more special moves. Then a year later, we had Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, which tweaked some characters and added super combos and Akuma. Then there was Hyper Street Fighter 2, then Super Turbo HD Remix. Jeez, Skyrim's bazillion versions are looking at this and laughing. Look, we get it. Street Fighter 2 is a beloved and influential mark in video game history. We just don't need to be reminded of it every few years. Nowadays, in our aforementioned age of DLC, this re-releasing business won't exactly fly with consumers unless something drastic happened that rendered it necessary. At least in the case of Street Fighter 4, every release after Super was released both as an update and a standalone for those who didn't have the previous version. Same with Street Fighter 5 Arcade Edition, but that's another story. He's Street Fighter 2, he's Street Fighter 2, you're Street Fighter 2, I'm Street Fighter 2! Are there any other Street Fighter 2s I should know about? Here comes a new challenger! I'm out of here. Internet connections aren't always reliable. Crashes, lag, downtime, it's a pain. Especially if you happen to be deployed military in a nuclear submarine. Boy, am I never gonna let that one go. You're doing Microsoft fails later, aren't you? Oh yeah. I've already touched on this in the Sony fails segment and criticized EA for the same thing, but I'm nothing if not an equal opportunity critic of gaming companies. Here you are all equally worthless. Yep, Capcom is a two-time offender in this regard. The first incident happened in 2010 with the release of Final Fight Double Impact, a two-pack containing the original Final Fight and another Capcom arcade classic called Magic Sword. As it turns out, Capcom saw the rise of so-called PS3 sharing as a threat and did something rather underhanded about it. If a PS3 user lost their connection to PSN while playing the game, they would be in for a nasty surprise. That's an odd way of saying they weren't allowed to play the game. And they did it again less than a year later with Bionic Commando Rearm 2. People were really excited to not be able to play their recently purchased, tonally appropriate reboot because of the PSN hack. Oh, the vicious cycle of DRM and piracy. iTunes figured out how to combat piracy ages ago. Just be a better service. Be smart about your distribution, and don't inconvenience the average gamer for the sake of a few criminals who will continue to find ways around your protection measures regardless. But that's another story. So, who wants to hear a story? Oh man, are we getting into some rich stuff now? 
In 2014, at the PlayStation Experience, the newest entry in the Street Fighter series was unveiled to be in development for PC and PlayStation 4, and Capcom hyped the living daylights out of it. They even offered a beta program for Street Fighter V in the summer of 2015 for players who pre-ordered the game. That's when the problems began. So many companies fail to realize the impact of their franchise's names when it comes to online play. Blizzard with Diablo, EA with SimCity, and who else but Capcom with Street Fighter V. People could not play the beta because of ridiculous traffic, so much that they had to take it offline and perform a stress test which took a few weeks. Not terrible, but certainly a bad omen for when the game finally came out, and oh boy. Street Fighter V at launch was a wreck. Not only were there still server issues after the beta, but the initial game was severely lacking. There was very little single player content, the process of grinding fight money was long if you didn't want to pay real money for the DLC, and PS4 users became aware of input delay that was as high as 8 frames. That might not seem like much to the average player, but for the competitive scene, this was a huge problem. With the heavy focus on the Capcom fighter network and axing of good single player, it was clear early on that Capcom was trying to push Street Fighter V as an eSport. But they forgot that games need to be complete games first. You know, build a passionate community, then they become eSports. The story mode in Season DLC did little to help, and longtime fans didn't even get a proper arcade mode until two years after launch. You know the launch of a game reeks of tone deafness when the updated version of the game feels more like it should have to begin with. But even with the addition of a huge arcade mode and several beloved characters, you can still tell that Capcom was going in hard on the eSports scene with the Capcom Pro Tour DLC each year. Especially recently, when they were posting ads in the game during the tour. This is the kind of shilling we save for free-to-play mobile games, not full retail releases! This one has its origins back in the era of the GameCube and the Capcom 5, a set of five games that were slated to be exclusives for the console. While Beautiful Joe did get some love, the one that had the most success by far was Resident Evil 4. This was a game that took a decidedly different turn for the previously survival horror-focused franchise in a direction that skewed more towards action. Now, action and horror can work together if Resident Evil 4 is any indication. Heck, any good writer can tell you that horror and comedy are strange bedfellows. But the success was misinterpreted, and the franchise slowly became more and more action-oriented and seemed less like the horror franchise people loved. Enter Resident Evil 6. To start off this cavalcade of crap, this professed horror game felt it needed a poorly implemented cover system with an unforgivable camera. My Pavlovian reservations aside, isn't this sort of mechanic usually reserved for a tactical action game? Not a horror game? And we're just getting started. Now, a franchise undergoing a tonal shift isn't necessarily bad. Case in point, people loved when the original Devil May Cry stopped taking itself so dang seriously and let Dante be, well... Dante. But the thing is, in order to pull it off, you have to do something to stand out. Resident Evil 6 doesn't do that, opting instead to play it safe and display itself as a generic third-person shooter, which, oddly enough, this franchise pioneered and did better before, while wallowing in every action flick trope they could cram into it. You know people actually hated the Resident Evil movies, right? You weren't supposed to copy them! And it abuses video game tropes it pioneered as well. The game is ridden with all these stick-wagging and button-mashing quick-time events, whereas in Resident Evil 4, they were spaced out, which gave them more tension and dread. Uh, okay, mostly. The co-op puzzles require no cooperation or just exclude one player entirely. This was done better in earlier games. With all the ridiculous linear action set pieces, sequences ending in explosions, horrible story pacing, and boring characters, you might as well have slapped directed by Michael Bay on the cover. This game was such a bad look for the franchise that even Capcom themselves realized they screwed up big time. Even worse that it managed to sell nearly 5 million copies and was still deemed a failure for some reason. Which is probably why they went back to the series' survival horror roots in Resident Evil 7, much to the applause of fans of the series. And this year, Capcom released a remake of Resident Evil 2, which was a resounding critical and financial success. In a time where cheap horror games are a dime a dozen, I figure Capcom realized they had to look back at how they brought the genre into the limelight in the first place. Took them until 2019, but hindsight's 2020, I guess. Oh sure, that's accidental.
Marvel vs. Capcom 2 was a beloved arcade game and people were itching for a sequel. We eventually got one with Marvel vs. Capcom 3. An alright game, but didn't quite make the splash that 2 did, and that's mainly due to the considerably smaller roster. There were a few characters that didn't make the cut and were going to be DLC, but the 2011 earthquake forced them to release Ultimate to recoup expenses. Given the circumstances, we can totally understand. Flash forward to the PlayStation experience of 2016, where we were greeted by a trailer featuring none other than My Boy X alongside Ryu duking it out with Iron Man and Captain Marvel. And there were Infinity Stones! The crowd was pumped as their hopes and dreams were realized. Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite was bringing the beloved crossover out of retirement. If only we knew the rocky road that lay ahead of us. The game somehow had even fewer characters than Marvel vs. Capcom 3, meaning it was only the MCU characters. This was due to Disney now having the rights for Marvel characters, and they went a little... My process. There's also a huge PR disaster about the roster and trying to defend it as characters just being functions, giving Ultron some of Magneto's iconic moveset, for example. That's like taking out Luigi in Smash, throwing in Fawful, and giving him the negative zone attack. I wouldn't mind that. No, no one asked you. you. Another issue with the game became apparent as the trailers came out leading up to the game's release. The game's production values were sorely lacking. Poorly rendered character models, bad voice direction, janky animations, the game was looking completely lackluster in presentation, which is especially egregious considering the series' lineage. This was not helping the game, especially since they were going in big with the cinematic story mode which honestly was looking more and more like a bad fanfic with every trailer. So with all this cut content and cut corners to cut costs, you'd think Capcom would try to give people a little more to make up for it. Absolutely, here's a very generous $30 for six characters, including half the main villain. You know it's really telling that this was a cash grab when Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, which had 20 DLC characters in its first season, still costs less money for characters than Infinite did. It's a real shame because despite all these snafus, the gameplay was really good. But one good apple isn't enough to save the barrel. Also, the Infinity Eggs. Never forget the Infinity Eggs. Oh, the decade of 2000 was a dark time. By that, I mean everything was trying to be darker and edgier. Some successes, many, many failures. We're gonna talk about this one. How did we go from an NES classic that found a place in Capcom's Hall of Fame to this crap? Let's start off at the character design. We have a dramatic shift from a goofy 80s cop art style to a dreary, humorless mess. Some guys can pull off dreadlocks, this boy cannot. Gone is the sly and witty Nathan Rad Spencer, and in his place is this brooding, suffering personality who can't stop saying fuck because he's a real man. And his silly bionic arm also has a dark gritty backstory. It's his wife. I shit you not. And we haven't even gotten to the gameplay. How about we start with that fancy schmancy wife arm and all the freedom it supposedly gives you. Yeah, all that freedom with linear level design. Seriously, this game promised players what Spider-Man on PS4 would actually give us nine years later. Only this reboot failed to deliver, since there are too many restrictions on exploration. Water? Don't try it, it will go exactly as you expect it. Also, there's the slight insignificant matter of deadly radiation all over the place. Yeah, so much freedom. There's also a problem with frequent load- screens. This is coupled with an incredibly boring combat that Just Cause 2 did better with similar mechanics, bare bones multiplayer that Uncharted does better with similar mechanics, and shameless product placement that Adam Sandler- okay, to be fair, it's not that bad. But at the end of it all, Bionic Commando 2009's darkness and grittiness isn't even ironically funny. It's just sad. At least we got rearmed too, and that was totally playable- uh oh. That game didn't even have multiplayer, what was the point? As stated before, DLC was such a great idea, being able to download quick fixes and extra content for the convenience of your home without having to completely remake a new version or release an expansion pack on a separate cartridge or disc. That's what it was supposed to do in theory. The reality is a little more annoying, and Capcom is one of the worst offenders of abusing this. We've already covered how Marvel Infinite charged 30 bucks for 6 characters, 
but they also kind of went a bit overboard for costumes too, with a costume pass that also sold for 30 bucks. Of course, that's only one game. In Marvel vs. Capcom 3, the two characters that actually were DLC instead of being shipped to Ultimate were, again, five bucks a pop. One of the biggest offenders, though, was Street Fighter Cross Tekken. While 12 characters for 20 bucks was admittedly much more reasonable in comparison, there was still all the costume packs, oh, and microtransactions for gem packs. There's also the issue with the DLC. By that, I mean disc-locked content. Street Fighter X Tekken and Resident Evil 5 both hid away content behind a paywall that was already on the disc. Resident Evil 5's Versus mode was discovered to be unusually small for DLC, because all they were doing was downloading a patcher key to unlock the mode. Street Fighter X Tekken was even worse, with 12 characters hidden on the disc. Capcom's excuse? It's more efficient and flexible. We apparently already have enough content, so what's wrong with holding some of it back to give it a little more longevity out of your purchase? Also, they were afraid that the DLC would be too much space for your console's hard drives. See? They're just thinking about you. <coughs> you okay? Oh, you know, sorry, I'm allergic to bullshit. Don't. Speaking of which, probably the stupidest use of DLC we've seen from Capcom is in terms of levels. Now, don't get me wrong, additional levels can add more fun to a game, as we've seen in Mega Man 9 and 10. But here's the thing. These were bonus levels. However, what you don't do is hide your true ending behind a paywall. Such is the fate that befell Asura's Wrath. Particularly good players got to the end of episode 18, only to be presented with a cliffhanger. How did this cliffhanger get resolved? You originally had to pay seven bucks to find out. Eventually, this was changed to require a whole bunch of S ranks, so at least Capcom seems to have learned from. Ahem! <coughs> uh, you've got to be kidding me. They did it again? Now, there are times when video games, even good ones, end up missing the mark in terms of sales. Bad publicity or marketing, ill-advised release date, or it ended up being overshadowed by other games. In fact, I made a whole countdown about those. And there is the shameless plug. Bite me. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of cult classics fit this bill. Beyond Good and Evil, Mad World, Earthbound, even games we regard as masterpieces like Conker's Bad Fur Day were commercial flops. Now this can happen to any gaming company, but it tends to hit Capcom more frequently than Genji requesting healing. Angela, I need healing. That, coupled with the fact that Capcom at one point had exorbitant requirements for a game to have a sequel, has led to at least a few franchises being left on the cutting room floor. Case in point, in 2014, Yoshiori Ono said in an interview that one requirement for a game to have a sequel was to sell 2 million copies. For many, even selling 1 million is something to be proud of. Now, the interview in question was concerning the Darkstalkers Resurrection Collection, but it's not the only game to have such ridiculous expectations. Other games that have fallen into the sales fail bin include, but are not limited to, Dragon's Dogma, Power Stone, Okami, the aforementioned Marvel Infinite, Monster Hunter Double Cross, Resident Evil 6 and 7, and Dead Rising 4, which eventually led to the closing of Capcom Vancouver. Yikes. Some of these failures are due to poor marketing, inflated budgets, PR disasters, or whatever the reason. And the sad thing is some of the games that are on this list pulled in sales figures that some other companies would kill to acquire. And yet, Capcom's definition of success was so far above what many other companies would dare to set, that what would seem like success to most went down as flops in Capcom's book. But at least they seem to have eased up a bit. After all, Mega Man 11 sold just under 1 million and Capcom was happy enough with it that the next game is being implied to be entering pre-production this year. A stark change for the franchise from the previous decade or so. You know, we've been doing a lot of foreshadowing today. Guess who's got two thumbs and is gonna talk about overworking employees again? This guy! Oi! Real talk though, this is something that we both take very seriously, and until it gets fixed, we're not gonna shut up about it. Why the gaming industry hasn't unionized yet is beyond me, because these stories just keep popping up. This story from 2012 comes from then-lead fighting game producer Yoshiori Ono, known for Street Fighter 4 and Street Fighter Cross Tekken. You know it's a bad look when he asks the reporter to have the headline be, Capcom overworks Ono. Oh no. Capcom refuses to allow any sort of trade union, and if you complain about the work, you're probably gonna get sacked. 
even if you overwork yourself to the point of hospitalization, you're expected to get right back to work. Not even I hope you're doing well, just hitting the ground running. In fact, you'll probably be required to travel to Rome for marketing. I hope she made lots of spaghetti. Ono has also noticed that Capcom employees regularly disappear after finishing a new game, and he suspects it's because they've been worked far too hard. And the day after a game is finished and goes off to manufacture, there are 10 empty desks, their previous occupants never to be seen again. So Capcom overworked their employees to the point of hospitalization, then fired them. That is a special kind of scummy. However, what puts this at number two on like other companies is that this really is the only story we have regarding such mistreatment, and we've had no other stories surface since or before. Either Capcom is just very good at slipping under the radar, or they've since cleaned up their act. Let's hope it's the latter. Brief shout out to Capcom's spotty record with localization. Not really that big of a fail, as many of the anachronisms become funny. Of course, better to have hilariously bad localization than none at all. Ace Attorney and Sengoku Basara fans can relate. Remember that one Smash Bros. Invitational? Mega Man's Final Smash hadn't been fully revealed yet, but that didn't stop Nintendo from including him in the demo. Who should grab the Smash Ball but Mega Man? Just listen to this reaction. It's so beautiful. That was not the reaction of a fan base that doesn't care. Mega Man clearly has a very passionate and dedicated following that loves the giant world of Reploids, Net Navvies, and super fighting robots. So to see it get mistreated so frequently is upsetting, even as someone who's not a fan. It still hurts. After all this time, it still hurts. How about I start in 2001 with Mega Man X5? Longtime series character designer turned producer Keiji Inafune had originally intended for X5 to be the end of the X series. Unfortunately, Capcom didn't appreciate a cash cow being put out to pasture, so they made X6 behind his back in less than a year. Now, I personally consider X6 to be a guilty pleasure, but it's clearly a rush job, and at times it even feels like a game that was made out of spite for Inafune. Not to mention it forced him to change his original vision for Mega Man Zero. And X7? People who follow me know how I feel about that train wreck. It was my Patreon milestone video. And there's your shameless plug. Hey, now we're even. How about we talk about the frightening amount of cancelled games starring the Blue Bomber? When Mega Man Legends 3 was announced on October of 2010, fans were HYPED! Inafune had left Capcom during development, but they trudged on. In fact, in a later interview, it was stated to be almost done. But in July of 2011, it just died. And sifting through these poorly worded tweets that accidentally placed blame on fans, it's still unclear as to why this game was ultimately canned. The fan backlash was enormous, spawning petitions and even an angry musical number. Suffice to say, it was a PR disaster. In the same time period, we had another Mega Man game with a ton of promise get sent prematurely to the scrap heap. In July of 2010, a teaser was shown for Mega Man Universe, a game later revealed to be based on user-created levels and even customizable characters, kinda like what Super Mario Maker would do years later. Even Ryu from Street Fighter and Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins were getting in on the act. But like Legends 3, it got the Spike Pit treatment, being cancelled in March of 2011. There was also going to be an MMO in Korea, which was announced in June 2010, but cancelled in March 2013. And even that's not all. It was revealed in 2013 that Armature, formed from Retro Studios expats, was working on a dark reboot of Mega Man X only for that game to be cancelled as well. It appears that without Inafune around, Capcom had no idea what to do do with Mega Man, and being unable to exercise his passion, he went on to... Oh... I blame Capcom for this. If they weren't such dum-dums, Inafune wouldn't have left and created that hot mess. Now in recent years, we've gotten some good Capcom games, including Mega Man games, but we still have a nasty taste in our mouths from the sheer amount of contempt they used to show for their flagship franchise. Despite the recent relative success of Mega Man 11 and both the Classic and X Legacy collections, which paint a hopeful future for the franchise, it still really hurts when you think about what could have been. Mistreating your employees is already bad enough, but when you mistreat your employees, your fans, 
and your legacy in such a short span of time, it takes a lot to regain the trust of gamers after that. Let's hope their recent successes don't go to their heads, or we could end up with something like this again. I'm the Fiery Joker. I'm the Quarter Guy. You can leave now. Cut!